So hi Karan, uh, thank you for joining in for the interview. And uh, just uh, for the record sake, uh, this interview might be published on YouTube and other social media channels. Okay. So let's start with your CV. I've got your CV in front of me. Uh, so why don't you start telling me about what you have done so far, and uh, and let's go with that. Okay. So I I'm working as a cloud engineer in a startup kind of and. Uh, a company where my project is to get the there there is a website called digital survey so we get clients who wants to publish their own digital websites and then there's a lot of volume of the customers or the clients who come onto these websites and do the digital surveys there are a few of the actions they want to do right so what we have done is that we design the website and then we try to use it uh, publish it on the cloud of their choice. We we put the scenario in between that what, how much they can afford, what's their budget. Based on that scenario, we, de we design the cloud systems, the architecture, and then we put those uh, website using Docker and Kubernetes using a CI/CD pipeline. So this is my day-to-day -day life. Okay, all right. So I can see that you have worked on Docker, you have worked on Kubernetes. Now, from the definition point of view, can you define a Docker file and its role? So Docker file, I would say, is a base, uh, a layer of files in which you put a base layer, and then you add on to the uh, layers, or you can add on some functionalities on it. So as a combined, when you run the Docker image, so its functioning is to run on top of each layer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, you also mentioned mentioned Docker Hub as a part of your skill set. So can mm -hmm. you share a scenario where you encountered any challenge in uh, securely storing and distributing Docker images? Okay, so I, I can I can think of a, a time when we were trying to push the Docker images and using an encryption over there, uh, but there, there was some issue with the encryption keys. So we were not able to pursue that. And how did you resolve that? So we, we use a different encryption keys, uh, which was associated or which was compatible with the Docker. Okay. Can you tell me how would you secure a Docker image? Sorry, I'm not sure about that. I haven't learned that. All right. uh, I've also seen that you have worked on cloud formation. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the role of cloud formation in automating the deployments? Yes. So what I have learned is that cloud formation is an automated tool uh, designed by AWS where it's where it does everything automated by themselves. It's it's like a PaaS platform as a service and you just uh, give the code and then it just deploy itself. Sorry, what do you understand by cloud formation? Uh, it's, it's an automated deployment uh, software or PaaS platform as a service. I I I I got what you said, but probably it's not what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's talk about something. Uh, let's talk about the monitoring tools. So, can you tell me uh, what's the purpose of Prometheus and Grafana in a monitoring system? Yeah, so Prometheus is to uh, use to log, make the logs and metrics where if, if there's an EC2 instance or one of the logs they are generating, maybe networks, maybe CPU utilization, we monitor that to check if there's a load or if there's any instance which is terminated or it's restarted, then, then we just get the logs from there. And for Grafana, we use it to make it as a dashboard so that all the logs are in a dashboard. It's easier to monitor them. And, and we can make also analytics over there. Okay. Can you tell me the difference between metrics and traces? So metrics is, you can say there are the uh, numbers on a scale, you can say one to 10. And traces is what we trace or like what we, um, I would say, it, it's, it's used for investigation, where it happened and how it happened exactly. Okay. So if, if, if something has gone wrong and we, we can use CloudWatch to trace where exactly it happened, where it exactly it went wrong. And metric is just is just a scale to measure uh, the numbers or the performance. And what are the components of a trace? Uh, I'm I'm not sure about that. Okay. What are the different types of metrics that you have captured? So CPU utilization, workload, storage. These are these are the few metrics I I work on. 
All right. Now, in terms of uh, you, you define Terraform and Cloud Formation both in your skills. Can mm -hmm. you tell me about a scenario where you need to integrate these tools for infrastructure provisioning? Yes. So uh, there, there was a scenario when we were trying to deploy this website uh, onto the AWS, and we used Terraform uh, to automate the deployment. Terraform is, is quite handy, I would say, uh, and it works with many cloud providers. So in, in Terraform, it's also easier. You just uh, define the resources and, and you can create it and you can destroy it. And it's also, so when, what I was reading about is that uh, it's like a blueprint. So it does everything by itself. What, what resource needs to be done before, what needs to be created before, Terraform understands that very well. You don't have to deploy that. You just write the, define the code and it does the thing for you. Okay. And what do you understand by state in Terraform? So state is like what we uh, what you have defined and what state is the current system is. So if you have designed, we want three instances and the Terraform uh, sees that current instance state is two instances, he, want, he would want to achieve that three instance state, what you have designed. What happens when you change a configuration manually instead of Terraform in a infrastructure? So if, if if there is a if there is a change in configuration, either the Terraform file can go corrupt, or or or, or it wants if it detects automatically, it may want to achieve the same uh, configuration what you have configured in Terraform. Okay. Can you tell me something about CloudFront and where have you used it? So CloudFront is the uh, CDN network. Uh, we have used it to uh, publish the website all over the world. The main thing which I uh, believe it's, it's the best functionality is the caching of the uh, resources or, or the data all over the world and it reduces the lag. So the only thing is that sometimes when you're pushing the new resource onto the CDN, it takes time, but once it's published, the latency is very less. So it's, it's used for uh, global content delivery network. That's what the CDN is. Okay. And you said that you worked on a website. Uh, mm -hmm. So what, what are the security aspects that you considered while building your application? So we wanted to make sure that uh, the uh, WAF, the, uh, uh, the firewall was configured properly. And if, if there is any uh, DNS attack, so we should, we should mitigate that. And also if, if there is any, uh, series of, uh, you can say, traffic increased. So we want to mitigate that using the ALB or scaling scaling uh, ASG, auto-scaling groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. And can you think of anything else that you implemented? As, as far as security, uh, the, I, I would say, uh, yeah. So the, so we, we implemented one in, in the geo configuration when we, we did not want certain countries to access the websites. So it's like a geofencing. You, you block certain countries from the uh, CDN and it's just from, from the routing, Route 53, and it just blocks it out. Okay. Can you tell me the importance of subnets and security groups? So, so security groups gives you, uh, gives you the authorization, I would say. So not every resource can access every resource. So only those authorized resources can access the data or the, they, can, they can connect to each other. Sorry, and what was the second thing? Uh, Subnet. Security groups. Subnet. So because I, what I believe is that IP, uh, IP is limited, the uh, number of IP. So subnets are used to even mask the IP addresses or, or give you more IP addresses under a network. Now tell me about some of the cost optimization strategies uh, that you have used. Okay. So uh, one was one was the uh, thing that we were trying to. Uh, so yeah, so I, I I remember this thing. So we were getting a lot of requests on the website, and because every request is paid, so. <laughs> And we were getting a lot of uh, bills and invoices on that. So what we used is that we reduced the number of uh, we reduced the number of 
request by caching the data in DynamoDB or using the CDN. So the request was just limited to CDN and it was not going to the DB or any other resources. So this is how we reduce the cost and it was it also uh, increased the uh, reduced the latency and the content was generated faster. What are the different cost optimization strategies that that you can use? Uh, I'm not sure about that, sorry. Okay. Tell me, have you worked on any serverless technologies? Uh, Lambda. Uh, I'm, I'm not good at Lambda, but I have worked a few things on it. Can you tell me what is a serverless? <laughs> Yeah, so serverless is when you do not need to deploy any instances or any, any server backend. Everything, the AWS or the cloud does it for you. And I can give you one example. So uh, we, had a, we had to de develop a functionality where it was a counter on the website. Whenever, the pe whenever people are coming on your website, it's a counter based. So what I used is that we used to, uh, there was a JS script uh, and we, we run the JS using a Lambda function. So Lambda function would uh, interrupt whenever a person used to come or a site was hit. And then Lambda function used to generate, uh, you can say, I forgot the name, sorry. So the Lambda function used to uh, reach out to DynamoDB and used to increment the counter and used to read this counter in the website again. So that's how we use the serverless. We do not, do not need to create any uh, server for that. We just, created the, we just wrote the code in Lambda, tested it, deployed it, it was working on the go. So under what circumstances would you use Lambda and not use your functions in EC2? So Lam Lambda has a limit of 15 minutes. So if if it goes, if, if there is any code which is running for more than 15 minutes, Lambda would go out. It would say it's a timeout. <laughs> so I, I would use function if the if the, the code requires more than 15 minutes. Okay. I also see in your resume that you have done some sort of technical support. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me the definitions for SLI, SLO, and SLA? SLA, I, I know, is the service level agreement. Whatever the request is coming in, there might be a certain time period. We have to check it, troubleshoot it, and resolve it. That, that's what I know about the SLA, but I don't know about the other tech terminologies. Okay. So service level indicators and uh, SLO is service level objectives? Uh, no, I've never heard about that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I see you have also worked in Kubernetes. Uh, can you tell me the components of Kubernetes and a high-level architecture? I have not worked much on that. I'm, I'm still under shadowing. All right. Tell me about uh, what do you understand by uh, VPN? So virtual private network is when, when there's a company who wants to secure their network and only gives access to the employees or the people they want to. So it's, it's, it's publicly denied. Not everyone can access it. You need certain credentials or authorization to access it. So it's, it's more of a secured network, you can say. And uh, if you've got uh, multiple VPNs, how do you establish mm -hmm. interconnectivity between them? So we're using a gateway. So it could be a star method or any other method. So we use gateways and two endpoints. So we can establish the connection between VPNs. Okay. And uh, have you when you when you need to establish between a VPN and your on premise, what sort of gateways would you use? Transit gateways we can use, or or I think there's another called uh, DX. I forgot the name, but it's between a uh, on prem system and between on cloud system. So we use that kind of gateway. <laughs> okay. Now GitHub, uh, you worked on GitHub as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me. Uh, What's a distributed system? What do you understand? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I, I know my micro architecture, microservice architecture and monolithic. So I'm not sure about that. Okay. Have you, have you done any sort of migration between monolithic to microservices? Uh, not at the moment, not the migration. Have I worked individually on that? All right, Karan. So I'm through with my questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just pause this recording and then I'll give you my feedback. Thank you for joining.